Good evening and once again welcome. This lesson is being recorded for February the 18th, 2024. This is the lesson that will be presented at 6 o'clock when we gather together here at the Rose Avenue Church of Christ. And as is always the case, if you are in our area, we do invite you to come and be with us as we gather together to worship God each week. We have a Bible study at 9.45 in the morning. We have a morning worship service at 10.50. We have the 6 o'clock Sunday evening worship service. And again, we have another service at 7.30 on Wednesday evening, which is another Bible study. Uh, today, before I actually get into the lesson for this evening, I just want to make a, a, a quick recording announcement. And that is you may have noticed that there is only one lesson being recorded today. And the reason for that is my Sunday morning lesson, which is dealing with how God works today providentially. Last week, the lesson that I recorded actually turned into a two-part lesson at our live assembly. And, and that happens from time to time because of the amount of time and because of the audience that is present. I may make the decision that I need to take a little extra time to develop some important points. And that was the case with that Sunday morning lesson. So in reality, uh, our lesson on the providence of God, I have made that into two different lessons. Now, I hope to make available the live recordings, which will be, which will be MP3 recordings. But the, uh, but the re video, there's only going to be one video associated with that particular lesson. So that's why there's only one lesson today. Next week we will uh, get back to um, a normal circumstance, even though next Sunday there will only be one recording as well, because on Sunday evening we are having our singing. But nevertheless, all that beside, uh, that's not why you're here. Let's go ahead and get started with the subject that we want to deal with in our lesson here this evening. Now, in dealing with this particular subject, I want to ask the question, is homosexuality a sin? As, as I present this particular lesson, you know, I, I realize that this is not a pleasant subject to deal with, but it is something that I think we need to address from time to time if we are going to show respect for what God teaches in his word. Now, it is certainly no secret that we are living in troubling times uh, morally. Those who are older can look back at the moral standings of uh, our country as well as the world just a few decades ago, and we know that we have seen a rapid decline in moral values. And, and that is tragic, and, and it, is, it is seen in a number of different areas. And so it is something that is of concern. Behaviors that were once considered sinful are now not only accepted, but in some cases they are proudly advocated or even demanded as being acceptable to all, all who are involved. And quite often those who would dare to question uh, immoral behavior, sometimes they are often uh, rejected, they're ridiculed, shamed, or, or maybe even bullied. Sometimes we are accused of being intolerant or out of touch with the times in which we are living. But of course, that doesn't change what God has actually said in his word about moral issues. And one area where we find this type of an idea being very prevalent is in the area of homosexuality. Now, when we deal with the subject of homosexuality, it's something that we need to talk about from time to time if we are going to respect the whole counsel of God's word. And I understand that this is not a, this is not a comfortable subject, and as you're going to see as I go through this lesson, that I am not being politically correct in any way. But I want you to understand that as I present this material, I am not presenting this with malice toward anyone. And, and I hope you can see that as we go through this lesson. I simply have a desire to, to follow what God teaches in his word and to teach what God teaches in his word following the standard that he has established for us. I believe that the Bible is the word of God and I believe that it is a, a standard that even though the New Testament was written 2,000 years ago, it was written um, under the guidance of God and intended for all time until the Lord returns. 
So keep that in mind as we deal with subjects like that. And if that is the case, if people are living in sin, we need to address those sins. And that's what I intend to do in this particular lesson. And furthermore, as Christians, we need to be reminded of God's will as Christians. You know, uh, sometimes the subject needs to be repeated from time to time because there may be those in the audience who have not heard why, why we oppose certain behaviors or why we support certain behaviors. There are sometimes generations where they just assume that everybody knows that this is why we believe it is wrong and they, they don't address it. Well, we need to address things from time to time, especially when they are things that are so prevalent where society is concerned. And that is the case with the subject of homosexuality. And that's, that's why I want to talk about in this particular lesson, is homosexuality a sin? And, and I'm sure that you can see by what I have already stated that it is my conviction that homosexuality is sinful behavior. But let's look at God's Word and see why that is the case. Now, when we talk about homosexuality, you know, first of all, let's define the term. You know, um, if you look up the term in a Bible dictionary, which is defining the word fornication or, or sexual immorality or homosexuality, uh, the definition that you will get in that is having sexual relations with one who is of the same gender. And, of course, when you look it up in a dictionary, an English dictionary, the modern dictionaries, they will add to that um, um, sexual or romantic attraction. So they include the description of homosexuality as being greater than, sim than simply the act of homosexuality itself. Now, you know, a few years ago when uh, the subject of homosexuality was preached about, um, it was, it, uh, you could preach on homosexuality and, and everything that was associated with that term was, uh, was understood in that. But we're living in times where it's uh, more challenging to address that. And there's actually a number of, of subjects that need to be addressed when you deal with the subject of homosexuality. Not only is there the act itself, but what about same-sex unions and, and same-sex marriage? Or what about gender identity or transgenderism uh, and, and uh, various other things along that line? Those are things that uh, have become far more prevalent in the past few decades. And thus, uh, those are subjects that need to be addressed as well. And incidentally, I don't have time to deal with those particular subjects in this lesson today and perhaps at another time in the future, uh, I will uh, address those particular issues uh, by themselves. But in order to deal with those subjects, you first have to lay the groundwork about what the Bible says about homosexuality because all of those subjects are related to that particular topic. Now, with that in mind, you know, as I've already pointed out, you know, we're living in troubling times, and we're living in times where things have changed. Uh, according to uh, Statista, uh, 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 in uh, uh, 2022, there was a survey that was released that, that showed that 71% of Americans believe that same-sex marriage should be recognized by law. In 1996, so you're talking about 20, uh, 25 years uh, or so earlier, that number was only 27%. That shows you how much the demographics have increased in that area. More and more churches are becoming accepting and tolerant of these behaviors with, any, with many sanctioning it by performing ceremonies, permitting it into their pulpits and such. But another, and always a concern that I have, and you know this if you listen to my preaching, another concern is there are many churches that have just chosen to remain silent. Or they, they send out an unclear message as to where they stand. Basically, they, they take a don't ask, don't tell type of approach to this particular subject. Is that acceptable when you're dealing with the souls of men and God is concerned about how people conduct themselves? So that's something we need to think about as we deal with this. 
And, 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 and as you continue to deal with this, another reason this is such a concern is that the media, in its various formats, has increasingly supported the gay lifestyle, even though statistics show, and these are based on statistics uh, uh, in 2021, 2022, statistics show that less than 3% of married couples are same-sex in the United States of America. But understand that that number is four times what it was just a decade ago, according to usafacts.org. Also, according to, to Gallup, in 2022, about 7.2% of adults identified as LGBT+, plus in, in one way or another. And, but understand that this is double what the percentage was in 2012. So just a decade ago, uh, the number of those who identify as such has doubled in the number. So it is something we deal with more. And one of the more alarming statistics that I came across, according to Statista.com, is that 19.7% of Generation Z, that is, those who were born between 1997 and 2004, and I'm assuming that this is dealing primarily with adults, they identify as LGBT+. One in five of that generation... And that is a huge jump from previous generations. As a matter of fact, uh, the, gen the millennials, which is the generation prior to that, was a little over 11%. And then you go down to all generations before that, the number was in the range of 3% or less. So that's, that's something that tells you what we are dealing with in our society. So it is obviously something that we need to ask the question, what does the Bible say about this subject? And so that's what I want to deal with in our lesson today. Because it is clear that these types of statistics, we need to take a stand. And we need to clarify our convictions upon subjects like this. Younger generations need to be reminded of why we teach what we do. And also, we all need clarity so that we can scripturally address these issues when we face them. If you sweep it under the carpet, how are you going to deal with somebody who wants to know what the Bible actually says about a given subject? So with that in mind, let's go ahead and spend some time talking about what the Bible has to say about the subject of homosexuality. And I'm going to go back to the Law of Moses where we find it uh, addressed basically for the first time. Now, I do not believe that this is the first time that homosexuality was, was actually prevalent in society or in the world, but I know the law of Moses dealt with it, and probably because it was something that was prevalent. And you read in Leviticus chapter 18 where you have various laws concerning morality, in verses 22 and 23 of that text, you read, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Nor shall you make with an animal to defile yourself with it. Nor shall any woman stand before an animal to make with it. It is perversion. And you go a couple more chapters where some of the penalties related to these, these sins are mentioned. In Leviticus 20 and verse 13, it says, If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman. So you've got the idea of he lies with a man the way that he would lie with a woman. What's that talking about? Both of them, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. I want you to note the observation that is made there is both parties involved have committed what God views as an abomination. And the penalty was they were to be put to death. That demonstrates seriousness where that is concerned. But you can actually, and you know, I, I have to stand corrected. I made the observation that Moses deals with it for the first time. Actually, it was dealt with in the book of Genesis. And I apologize for not making that point properly. You go back to the time of Abraham, which was about 500 years before the law of Moses. You find in Exodus chapter 18 that the Lord, along with two other angels, appears to Abraham. 
And this is the occasion where the Lord is going to tell Abraham that they are going to Sodom and Gomorrah for the purpose of destroying that city. And what you read in verses 20 and 21 of Genesis chapter 18 says there in that text, it says, The Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So the Lord says the, 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 sinful, uh, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah are so egregious that they need to be dealt with. And of course, this is the passage where, where Abraham uh, pleads with God, will you destroy the city if there's 50 righteous souls? And, and, and the Lord says, no. What about 45? No, 40. No. And he takes it all the way down to 10 righteous souls. And the Lord says, if there's 10 righteous souls in that city, I won't destroy it. What a sad thing. But then we come to Genesis chapter 19, where we read about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And basically what you have there is you read there in Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 1 that two angels, they, they arrive in the city and they come in the evening and they go into the square of the city. And of course Lot, Abraham's nephew, who is a righteous man um, in a wicked city, he comes and insists that they not stay in the open square. And so he takes them into his home. Well, you read in the text that the men of the city, both young and old alike, come to the house of Lot and they demand that he bring out those men. And the, and the way that they say it is you bring them out to us that we may know them is the point that is made in there. And so that's the challenge that takes place there. We want to know them. Now that expression, know them, that's not just not talking about, you know what? We want to talk to them and visit with them a little bit. It is, it is a term that can imply the idea of relations, having relations with someone. For example, in Genesis 4 and verse 1, Adam knew his wife. Uh, or uh, Genesis 4 and verse 17, Cain knew his wife. And both passages talk about how they bore children. So the point is, is the idea of that is that term no can have the idea of relations. And when you tie this together with other texts, it becomes clear that that is what is meant in this particular text. And you know, it's a challenge because Lot comes out to them and says, please don't do this. You, this is the reason they have come to this city. And uh, Lot even offers them his two virgin daughters. I want you to think about that. I can't fathom why he would do that. But nothing happened to them. They weren't interested in that. They wanted these men to know them. And they reach the point where, where Lot refuses. They press against the door. They pre Lot, press lots against, Lot against the door. And they determine that they're going to do violence to him. And the angels pull him inside. And they struck the men blind. But yet the men, it says that they became weary trying to find the door. Even being struck blind did not stop them from their behavior. And of course, the sad reality is, is the rest of the chapter, chapter records that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by an act of God. He rained down fire and brimstone upon the cities, and they were destroyed. But I'm going to tell you right now, we learn more about Sodom and Gomorrah in the New Testament. And there's two passages that we would appeal to in particular in dealing with this. The first one is in Jude 7. And incidentally, it's the, the other one is a companion passage to Jude 7. And that's found in 2 Peter chapter 2, which we'll deal with in a moment. But here we find in this passage where Jude is dealing with the, the destiny of false teachers. That's really the point. And he makes the point, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these having given themselves over to sexual immorality or fornication, that's another way, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, and gone after strange flesh. They set forth, they are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So he uses that expression, they have gone after strange flesh. 
something that is not natural. We'll deal with that in another verse in a few moments. But let's take a moment, and then let's just talk about that term. Uh, they've given themselves over to the fornication. Some version, matter of fact, King James, New King James uses the word sexual immorality. I think the King James uses the word fornication here. And I think that that's actually the better word because it nails down what you're dealing with. Now, by definition, the word fornication is unlawful sexual relations. That's what you're dealing with. And if you talk about unlawful, in reality, in Scripture, what that means is any relations outside of a lawful marriage. You know, over in Hebrews chapter 13 and in verse number 4, the Hebrew writer there said that the marriage bed is undefiled. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So you've got the idea of marriage being honorable. And basically the implication there is, is uh, fornication, God's going to judge that. And, and fornication refers to any, any unlawful relations, any relations other than the relations between a husband and wife. And that would include adultery, which is a spouse who was unfaithful. That would include premarital relations. That would include bestiality. That would include pedophilia, prostitution, uh, homosexuality in its various forms. All of that is considered fornication. And fornication, you need to understand, is a, is a chosen behavior. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and in verse number 18, Paul there said, Flee sexual immorality, and that's this word, fornication. Flee sexual immorality. He says, every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And the way that he's writing that there, he's telling you, you need to run away from it. It's, if you do it, it's something that you are choosing to do, which is true with all sins, something to give consideration to. Furthermore, Jesus described it as an action of the heart, where he talks about it's what comes out of the heart that defiles a man. And in Mark chapter 7... And in verse number 21, Jesus there said, What comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile a man. And he included fornication in that description. Over in 1 Thessalonians 4, in verse number 3, we are told there to, to flee fornication or, or flee sexual immorality. Run away from it. You've got another passage that challenges us that that is what you are to do. And then Revelation 21, in verse number 8, and this is by no means the only passage, but Revelation 21, in verse number 8, tells us, it says, The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, Sexually immoral or fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those who continue in this lifestyle, they're going to be eternally condemned. That's the point. That's the point that is made in that text. And as I said, you're going to see that this is not the only text of which that is said. Now, so that's the idea of fornication, and recall that we were just talking about Jude, verse 7, that they had given themselves over to fornication and gone after strange flesh. Now we come to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, also dealing with false teachers and their destinies, and, and examples are given of those whom God punished because of their wickedness. And he said that he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them <coughs> to destruction, making them an example that those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous lot who was oppressed by their the filthy conduct of the wicked. That's the way this behavior is described, and that's the way God views it. Sodom and Gomorrah were, de were destroyed because of their homosexual behavior. Another passage that we might want to give consideration to, and I won't talk about this for just a few moments, is Romans chapter 1. Because this is a passage 
that shows the progression that leads to various unrighteous and sinful behaviors. Not just homosexuality, but you're going to see that that's developed in this text. So we begin with verse number 18 of this text. And in that passage you read there, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteous, uh, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in righteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The first point I want you to see here is in verse number 18, is Paul is pointing out that the wrath of God is revealed against heaven. He's about to deal with some things that are related to the wrath of God. What, bring, what will bring on the wrath of God? And he points out in this text, it is ungodliness and unrighteousness. It is men who have suppressed the truth of God. And even though there's ample evidence for the existence of God, they have rejected that. And so he says in the latter part of verse 20, they're without excuse. Well, continue in the text in verse 21, why are they without excuse? Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but being futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools. So the observation is made here is although they knew God. So, you know, here we're dealing with people who acknowledge that God exists. And that's a whole other story within itself, given the times that we are living in. But although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. They were not grateful for God for whom he declared himself to be. And as a result of that, it says their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise. They became, fo fo they became uh, fools. They were, their thoughts were futile. And again, the point is they were rejecting God. That's what all those expressions are saying. They had nothing to do with what God wants man to do. They behave based upon their own desires rather than the desires of God. And as a result of that type of an attitude, foolish hearts darkened, appealing to their own wisdom over the wisdom of God, which is revealed in his word. You read in verse 3 of that text, it says there, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God in, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So you have here in this text, they changed the glory of God into idols. Another way of saying this is they basically made God into what they wanted him to be. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, that's the problem with any sin. That's the problem with any behavior that somebody continually persists in. They have made God into what they want him to be. Especially when you have somebody that they're, they're living in something that they know is not what the Bible teaches that they ought to be doing. Then they say, I'm okay anyways. They basically say, I, uh, uh, you know, um, this is what I think God ought to be and that's the way I'm going to view God. They, they, they reason that God thinks the way we do. And he's, going to and he's going to tolerate my interpretation of what he tells me to do. So I can interpret his word any way that I want. And he's going to accept me. That's the attitude that we're talking about here. Changing the glory of God into man-made images. Making him into what they want him to be. But then that brings us to what we want to deal with here. In verse 24, where it says in the text, Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And what you read in that text is God basically said, I'm not going to force you to follow me. You choose to do what you want. Go, go ahead. There's going to be a consequence later on. But I'm not going to stand in here like I did with Sodom and Gomorrah, and just shut it down. You know, it's up to you to choose to follow me. And he makes the point that there was lust in their hearts, 
and they dishonored their bodies among themselves. And the point that is being made by that expression is they dishonored their bodies the way that God intended for them to use their bodies, within the boundaries that God intended for their bodies to be used. And that's why you read in verse number 25 that they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. That's what we've been talking about. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. They're serving themselves. They're choosing to worship themselves in their own ways rather than submitting to the will of God. And how often do people today, they choose the way that they want to worship uh, the, the way that they want to worship God, and they call it true worship. You know, when you've got somebody that is going, looking for a church, and, and they're asking, what's in it for me? And, and, and they, they, set out, they set out with a disposition, well, these are the things that I want in a church. And we're not talking about, uh, I, I want a church that's going to hold me accountable if I don't follow God's word. No, they, I, I want a church that's going to accept me even though I engage in this behavior uh, or, or that behavior. And you can go on and on down the list of what we are talking about. Verse 27, verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Women were doing things that was contrary to what nature teaches. Women with women is what you would have in that particular text there. And then in verse 27, likewise also the men, likewise. So if this is uh, tying what was said in the previous verse to this. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Friends, that's describing homosexuality there. Whether you're talking about the male homosexuality or lesbianism among women, that's what that is describing. And what it describes is it's not natural. And if you think about it, it's not natural. God created man and woman to be together, and that's the only way that we can reproduce. Homosexuality cannot naturally reproduce. And that's the reality of the situation. And that's what's described. And then, and then in the rest of the text, we, we, we have a number of different sins that are described here. And, 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 and what I see in this is, is I see the idea that when you reject God, it, it, leads to, it leads to behaviors where you're doing what gratifies yourself rather than what's pleasing to God. And that just goes down a road that leads to worse and worse behaviors and more and more things that are ungodly. You read this text where it says here, and in verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so they threw the idea of God out. God gave them over to a debased mind, we hear that again, to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication or sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, their whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parent, undeserving, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. In all of those verses, you know the sad reality is, is if you watch the news media, you know, the news media is incredibly negative now because they're reporting so much bad news. And every one of these things from time to time, you find them in the news in the behaviors of people. That brings you to verse 32, which says, who, in, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. You're going to stand condemned. But I want you to note that he says, not only those who do the same, but listen to me clearly, also approve of those practicing these things. Friends, you want to know why we need to preach on this? 
because it's not just enough to, to be involved in it, we can't approve of it either. If it is a sinful behavior, we cannot approve of it and be pleasing to God. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse number 17. So that's what we need to keep in mind, or Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse number, uh, uh, verse number 11, that is. So keep that in mind. There's another passage that we want to give consideration to. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, here Paul is describing those, well, 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 let's read it. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. So the warning is there that fornicators, and we've already established fornication is related to homosexuality, but here Paul goes further and describes other examples of that. He talks about adulterers. He talks about homosexuals and sodomites. Now you got two different words here. Well, what do these words mean? Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about them in the Greek. The word homosexual is a word that literally means the idea of being soft. Or we might use the term effeminate. The King James, that's the word that it uses there. And what this has relation, or what this has, uh, uh, what this means is talking about a male who submits his body to unnatural lewdness. And if you understand anything about procreation, you understand the, the, the purpose that a male is supposed to have. But here in K, rather than doing what he's supposed to do, he submits to somebody else. The other word, sodomite, describes, quote, one who lies with a male as with a female. In other words, he is taking the active role in the act between uh, two men is the way that this is described here. And the point I want you to understand is both parties are identified. And what we're told is they will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a powerful warning. Uh, one more passage before we move on from here. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse number 10. And here's a passage where, where Paul is instructing Timothy to, to uh, basically remain in Ephesus and to teach these brethren the truth. And he makes an observation in verse number uh, 9 where he says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly, for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. So he's made the point here that the law is made for unbelievers. You know, when you think about why laws are typically made, and I know there's different reasons to make a law, but basically the reason laws are made is because people don't behave. And laws regulate how to behave yourself. And most laws are negative. That is, most laws come with penalties if you don't do what is said, whether it's about what you're supposed to do or what you're not supposed to do. How often do we have to modify our laws because criminals are constantly looking for loopholes and other ways to, to take advantage and exploit people? And so a law is created to close the loophole. So that's the idea. Now he's made this point, all these people for murderers, now notice verse 10, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. What's he mean by sound doctrine? He's talking, he's talking about God's word. And all of these things are described as being contrary to the truth of God's word. So friends, there's a handful of passages in scripture that make it clear that homosexuality is a sin. Now I don't have a lot of time, but I just want to just kind of briefly mention some of the uh, arguments that are made 
by advocates of, uh, of homosexuality. And by, in, by no means am I going to exhaustively deal with these arguments. And perhaps another lesson could be developed just dealing with the arguments that are made. One of them, and this is probably one of the more predominant ones today, is the fact that homosexuality is a genetic, uh, is a genetic quality. In other words, you're born that way. And if you're born that way, you can't help it. And basically, so what they are saying is, God would not f condemn me for acting the way that I was born. Well, I'm going to tell you right now that this is a controversial subject. And while there's been some cert or some research done, and, and, and they will uh, state some research for primarily dealing with uh, the study of twins who are separated at birth, birth identical twins uh, uh, as well as fraternal twins and so on, they might deal with those but they, they will basically talk about how there's a percentage of them, uh, and I guess it's a little over 50%, just over 50% of them. Uh, if one was homosexual, the other would. The other would be homosexual. But, and they'll use that as an argument, that it's a, it's, it's a pre-born disposition. Well, uh, you know what, if it's something, that, if it's something that's genetic, and you're dealing with identical twins, why is it not true in 100% of the cases? <clears throat> That's really the point to consider there. But, but going beyond that, you know, while there might be some tendencies uh, that, that somebody is born with, uh, you know, th there's no de definitive proof that this behavior is genetic and that it's uncontrollable, that they can't help it, that they can't make choice. I contend that environment plays a bigger factor in what one becomes. The way that you're raised, who you associate with, what you are allowing to teach you and to formulate your values is going to have a greater influence on what you become. And I, I appeal to this example of, uh, of Gen X. Gen X where 19.7 have identified themselves as, as, as homosexual in one way or another. Think that one in five and yet you go to the previous generation, the millennials, it's a little over 11%, and then it just drops to three. How did it get that big that fast? Well, I'll tell you how. It's because of media. It's because of indoctrination. It's because in much of the school system, they are being encouraged to experiment with these behaviors. And so you have the idea of what is being taught in society is the direction that many of these individuals are going. And there's a whole lot of other issues that are associated with this, but that's basically a brief answer to that. And also, you know, uh, you know what about somebody that has the tendencies toward alcoholism or gambling or other addictive behaviors or somebody that has a tendency toward anger? If it's the way that they're born, does that mean that we ignore it? Or do they need help in overcoming those things? You know, something which many legislatures don't want to allow if somebody is a homosexual and they want to, they want to transition out of that. So, uh, so uh, the argument is gen genetic is not a, is not a, is not a valid argument within itself. Well, then, those who profess to follow the Bible, they will take these texts and, and they, will, they will interpret them differently from the way that they are written. For example, they talked about what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was, was violence, and the fact that they were not hospitable to these men. And yeah, you can see in the text that they were both violent and inhospitable. But I'm going to tell you right now, when you look at the other text. You look at Jude 7, it described fornication and strange flesh. That has nothing to do with hospitality or with violence within itself. And then you look at the behavior and the wording of Genesis 19, where they talked about bring them out that we may know them. Obviously, that's us talking about meeting them. They wanted to do something with them that they had no authority to do. This was sexual deviancy that was being addressed and that was condemned. Well, another argument that might be made is, yeah, Romans 1 condemns certain homosexual behavior. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 
1 Timothy chapter 1 condemns certain sinful behaviors and they might make the arguments they might say that they might say in Romans chapter 1 if you have someone that's not born that way and they might acknowledge at least for the sake of this verse oh there may be some that that's not what they really are but they just choose to follow after that or or actually they're following after a promiscuous lifestyle and that's kind of the way that they are that they argue that or or maybe it's dealing with prostitution or or or, or an owner of a of a male boy slave that that he abuses involuntarily those are the types of things that they tie and say that's what's being condemned he said but if two men love each other two women love each other that's not what's condemned in those texts well, friends, I just encourage you to read the text and tell me where it says that. Just look through the texts. And you find that's not stated in those ideas at all. Well, another argument that some might make is the fact that, you know, uh, in the Gospels, Jesus never outright condemned homosexual behavior. It's true that you do not read in the Gospels that uh, Jesus said... Um, uh, if a man lies with a man, he will spend eternity lost. But I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus would lived under the old law, lived during the time of the old law, and he kept the old law perfectly, and we've already shown you what the old law said. It was a death penalty. And furthermore, Jesus did allude to it in his teachings in Matthew 19, dealing with the subject of divorce and remarriage, where when they ask, is it lawful to divorce for any reason? And Jesus goes back to Genesis chapter 2. Have you not read that God made them in the beginning, male and female? Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus was emphasizing that that is what God intends. And that is the point. And friends, I'm going to tell you right now, this is, a, this is a point of authority that we need to understand as we study God's word. Silence is not consent. There's a lot of people today that they, that they justify what they're doing because, well, he didn't say I couldn't. Well, that's not justifiable within itself. You need to look at what he does tell you to do and respect the boundaries that he has put in place. And I'm going to tell you right now, silence is not consent, especially when what the apostles wrote was from the Lord. You know, Paul over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, in verse number 37, he said there in that text, if, any man think, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. And I'm going to tell you now, that's what Jesus taught in John 14 and verse 26. He taught his disciples that when I leave you, the helper is going to come, and he's going to bring to your remembrance all things that I commanded you. In Luke chapter 10 and in verse number 16, Jesus there said, He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. He who rejects me rejects him who sent me. What the apostles taught was in agreement with what Jesus taught and believed and emphasized. So when you go to 1 Corinthians and when you go to Romans and they condemn homosexuality, that's as if the Lord is condemning it also. And so that argument, like the others, is not valid. Now that's a few arguments that we can do, and there's others. But just for, the, just for two or three minutes as I wrap this lesson up, there's a couple of other observations I want to make, and I think we need to think about this when we're dealing with the, the subject of homosexuality. And that is we need to ask the question, okay, if somebody is a homosexual, how should we as Christians treat them? And let me begin by saying this. I want you to understand that homophobia is sinful. Now, the word homophobia, it's, de it's defined as hatred of homosexuals. It's the idea of negative attitudes and feelings toward them as individuals. You know, when I read my Bible, <coughs> we're not supposed to hate others in general. We're supposed to love. Even our enemies we are to love. How else are you going to be able to, to serve them and, and teach them if you don't love them? 
Now, I want you to understand, we may be labeled homophobic because we stand for the truth, but that doesn't mean we are. We do hate sin, but we must not hate the sinner. And we need to be careful with our attitude toward those who are engaged in sinful behaviors, whatever the sinful behavior is. And that brings me to the second point. You need to treat a homosexual as you would any other sinner. The truth is, is they're in a lost condition. They need salvation. And you know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to love them. You read over in Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse number 15 that we speak the truth in love to individuals. Over in, over in a Proverbs chapter 15 verses 1 and 2 we read that text a soft answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. Soft answer. We need to be delicate as we, as we answer people. You know, the servant of the Lord must be gentle, willing to yield, uh, and other things as it describes him there. He must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. And so you find the way we need to learn. If somebody, if somebody is genuinely interested in studying God's Word, now there may be those who cut you off and they, they want nothing to do with you. That's one thing. But if somebody genuinely wants to know and they come to you and acknowledge that they have sin in their life, whatever the sin is, you need to help them. Love them as you try to teach them what the gospel actually says. And you need to have faith in the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. It is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of joints and marrow and of soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4.12. And I want you to turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 here real quick. In this passage, remember, this is where Paul mentioned homosexuals and sodomites and fornicators and adulterers and how they will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I want you to notice verse 11. Verse 11 says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You used to be that way, but you're not that way anymore. You have been converted. You have changed. We need to understand that the gospel can change sinners. And so if a homosexual comes to you and they want to know what the truth is and, and when they're convicted and they want to change, what we need to do is we need to help them to overcome the weaknesses in their lives. Show them how they can overcome their sin by living the godly life and lead them in the direction of some things that they can do that will help them to overcome whatever the sin is in their life. Notice how I keep saying whatever the sin is? Because this is the pattern that applies to anybody who's struggling with a sinful behavior. Show them that they can be transformed by the renewing of their mind and that that's where the transformation has to begin. Romans 12 and verse 2. And finally, and tied to this, we need to be compassionate and patient with those who are trying to serve God and trying to overcome whatever it is in their life. We need to understand that repentance is not an easy thing to do, especially when you're dealing with somebody who this has been their way of life. You may be dealing with somebody who comes to you with baggage, whether that baggage involves addictions, whether it involves past traumas in their lives, or, or various other things, broken homes, and various other things. They're struggling, and they're broken, and they need to be spiritually healed. We're told to help them in those things. You read over in uh, Galatians chapter 6. If a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritually restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You got somebody who wants to change? Help them. 
Help them. Be loving and compassionate. Now, that doesn't mean you're tolerating their sinful behavior. But that's what we need to do. And as, as, as you can see in this, this applies to every different type of sin. So I hope you can see in this lesson, and I know that this is a lengthy lesson, uh, but uh, 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 we can see that homosexuality is condemned in Scripture. And it is not a behavior that we ought to condone or welcome in our midst. Now that doesn't mean we can't study with somebody and that somebody cannot be converted. And that's one of the things I'm concerned about. You know, so think about that. And you know, if you desire to be right with God, is there some way that we can help you with that? Think about that, and, and I, I humbly submit this lesson to you. So if you would, please bow with me at this time. Our dear God and our Heavenly Father, once again we come to you, and we thank you for blessing us in so many ways. We know that you love us. We know that you love all of mankind, and your desire for all of mankind is that they will come to repentance and to submit to your will so that you can save them and give them eternity with you. Dear God, help us to have a proper attitude toward those who are not following your ways and help us to do what we can to be the proper influence to them, to encourage them to come to you or to come back to you if that is the need. Help us to let our light shine and help us to conduct ourselves with good behavior in all that we do and at all times. Thank you for loving us. Help us to live our lives looking toward a home in heaven with you when this life is over. We ask all this in your son's name and amen. And again, thank you for listening to this lesson. I hope you find some benefit in the things that are said. Or as, as I mentioned at the beginning, this isn't, this isn't one of those pleasant topics that, uh, you know, I wish I didn't have to preach on this. But the reality is, it is prevalent and it needs to be addressed in our midst. So, so think about that. But in the meantime, you go out and you just be the example that God wants you to be. And until next time, have a good day and have a good way, a week. And thank you for listening and goodbye.